Hola, amigos y amigos. Hello, my friends. Good morning. Good afternoon. We hope that all of you are well. We are here again and delighted to share with our wonderful audience from China, from Europe, from Latin America, Canada, the United States, and of course in Mexico. A month ago, in China, you were very affected by a strong COVID outbreak. And we have asked you, and it appears to still be very bad. We wish you well. And that things can get better in that sense. A month ago, as well, the Russian bombing on Ukraine also began, which worries us all. And we fervently hope that we can reach peace agreements as soon as possible for Ukraine and for the rest of the world. As always, we are very grateful to the Global University for Sustainability in Hong Kong for offering this global space for a dialogue without borders, which allows us to reflect and to nourish our minds and spirits. Seeking to listen to each other, to understand each other, and to reach new levels of transformative consciousness. We thank and also acknowledge Do Dr. Lau Kin Chi and Dr. Margaret Jede, as well as the team of interpreters who make it possible for us to understand each other. We would also like to mention that this work, we do it as a team with our colleagues, meta coaches, who are Marcela Ramirez and Salvador Cepeda. This teamwork has a clear intention to contribute and to seek paths of convergence from a rich totality of unity in diversity. This gives us hope, hope for visions and strategies that will allow us to be useful and credible. This presentation is the third of seven sessions where we aim to explore and to expand the emergence of consciousness as an endogenous and evolutionary process, which we have called the 13 moons of the awakening of consciousness. Our intention is to deepen and to continue learning from our experiences lived among the indigenous communities of Chiapas between 1960 and 1980. We will present narratives, the philosophy, images, and shared reflections with the aim of approaching the wisdom of these originary and millenary peoples, original peoples, who offer us models of sustainable civilization. So far, we have addressed the topics that we mentioned here. First of all, we talked about the hidden consciousness of the cosmic connection. This was presented through Mayan archaeology of Chichen Itza and the Tzolkin or Mayan calendar that guides the journey of life through the confluence of the seals and tones giving meaning and vibration to existence as an aligned totality. In our second session, we called it the cultural consciousness of the community, and we presented the Popol Vuh, the book of the community, whose understanding leads us towards an effort of constant transformation. In the structure of the Mayan language, Tzal, Tzal, we find the key words of Mayan philosophy and culture, earth, water, community, unity, heart of heaven, heart of the earth. The third had to do with the consciousness of the sacred and obedience to the mandate of the community. This highlights the identity of the link between the I and the we without losing strength and value of the person who is 
forged in the community as part of the we. The community is a reference for life. To be an authority is to be a worker, is to be a servant of the community itself. Now for this session, we will address two themes, consciousness challenged in the face of new paradigms and consciousness affirmed from the cry for the earth. To continue with these themes requires for us, first of all, to understand various contexts that influenced both internationally and nationally, and also the realities of the state of Chiapas during the decades and years before we began our coexistence and work. Being with the indigenous people of Chiapas gave us the privilege of living with gentle, simple, and wise people, learning with them about different forms of human behavior that surprised us and also made us admire them. We realized how solid the Mesoamerican civilization was. We became aware of its resilience and persistence founded and grounded in the values of common good. We were very pleased with the respect, care, and sense of unity that the indigenous people had with all beings and facets of nature. So these experiences also led us to question the trajectory of the Western world and the culture where we were brought up in, in which we were brought up studied and lived whose influence we began to perceive as increasingly harmful and destructive. Now we are going to start with the caracol or the snail. Let us begin now as we will do in each session in the same way that we have been doing in, up to now because it's like a sacred summoning that is done in the communities, especially when there is a special occasion. Now we are going to see then the sound, and we're going to listen to the sound of the caracol, so as to join together. the caracol or the shell, we are now going to start with a video that describes the beginning of our reflection. Contexto mundial. World context. Now let's take a leap in history to the 20th century. The objective here is to understand the new living conditions generated in the world and national society, and in particular for the state of Chiapas and the indigenous world between 1960 and 1980. Between 1914 and 1918, we had the First World War, which caused the death between 40 and 60 million people. A few 20, just a few 20 years later, the Second World War produced 70 to 80 million deaths between 1939 and 1945. These were conflicts that took place mainly between empires and world powers. They ended up inaugurating the era of nuclear weapons that has continued to proliferate and still present a real possibility of annihilating entire life on the planet. However, at the end of these wars, 
political results were based on conciliatory agreements to create a new peace pact and new instruments of coexistence. The United Nations is created in 1945 by 51 countries that established that they would maintain international peace and security, they would foster friendly relations among nations and promote social progress, improve life standards and human rights that were pro proclaimed as universal in 1948. The result of the agreements after the wars was a worldwide social welfare state that achieved between 1950 and 1973 the greatest growth of economic assets in human history. One, a growth of the GDP with peaks of up to 6% and the contents maintenance of the GDP at 3%. Two, unemployment plummeted to a level of 2.6 on a global level. Unemployment was considered a right. Three, prices in general had a maximum increase of 4% throughout the period. This was when the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund were created as a product, as a result of new financial relationships. The US emerged as the dominant winner of World War II and as such established political economic rules, creating the dollar as the world reference currency due to the established and fixed price of gold at $35 per ounce with the possibility of unlimited sales of gold or dollars. The US also implemented the Marshall Plan to rebuild devastation of the war and forge strong alliances with Western European countries and later with Japan and Korea that were emerging as powers in Asia. Latin American countries had to follow the stabilizing development, which meant following the formulas and patterns of the great metropolis covering the same guidelines. On the other hand, they began to create projects financed by credits from the World Bank and the IMF, whose rules established the objectives, methodologies, and the instruments that were to be fulfilled, as well as the interest and deadlines to pay off the debts, which implied having entered development. With the passing of a few decades, we now see that this development model and the debts generated have become the main causes of greater hunger, poverty, and underdevelopment in poor countries. In Mexico, we had the golden, the so-called golden decades, characterized by a generous state with a nationalist and popular ideology, which strengthened a dominant party, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or PRI. It created official unions that benefited from great privileges. Only 13% of the total amount of workers belonged to this elite, leaving the rest of the workers totally unprotected. The development of the Mexican state focused on implementing a macro economy, generating a fixed exchange rate with the dollar for almost three decades. It also substituted imports, creating a national industry, industry with its own te technology. It invested in infrastructure, developing roads, railroads, oil, water resources, and electric power sources. It subsidized companies with transportation, cheap energy, water, and petrochemicals. It benefited workers with education and some low-income housing. It sought to regulate the prices of basic products of popular consumption and coffee, creating the Cona Supo stores in 1962. In terms of its population, Mexico grew from 28 million people in 1950 to 48 million in 1970. The population in the 60s and 70s was characterized for being very young with the average with an average of age between 22 and 24 years it's important to mention that those years were also years of a hegemonic presidentialism of absolute power and unprecedented corruption due to the discretionary use of public funds and development resources without 
any citizen control. These gold, so-called golden decades ended tragically with a governmental massacre of more than 500 university students in a demonstration in the Tlatelolco Square in Mexico City in the year 1968. Gustavo Díaz Ordaz was the president of Mexico at that time. Two years later, when the president, president inaugurated the International Soccer Cup as part of the Olympic Games in Mexico, the entire stadium greeted him, not with the usual robust applause, but with boos and jeers. civilizing confrontation or confrontation of civilizations. Nuestra intención Our in intention for this series of presentations with this series of presentations is to explore the development of consciousness as a possibility to contribute to a sustainable civilizational model. Under the Western civilizational model under which we are currently living, we have touched on the period referring to the two world wars that took the lives of 130 million human beings. So we ask ourselves, we wonder, what is the direction, the dynamics and the destiny, the fate of this system whose technological, financial, and human investment prioritizes war. The current war potential could destroy our planet several times over and in a very short period of time. What is necessary to change this course? Is it possible to do so? We also ask ourselves from another view of the future of the community of this planet of humans, is the Mesoamerican Mayan civilizational model, which incorporates the whole as shared patrimony of everybody and grants as inheritance, not only resources, but also understanding, knowledge, technology, production and consumption, and the forms of organization in a rich range of millenary experiences. Our consciousness empowers us to influence through our thoughts, through our attitudes and our actions towards a desired fate. Our, are we convinced of the power of our personal and associated consciousness? Who, let's imagine who we would become by acting from this vital perspective and spirit of a union of consciousnesses. So, under this understanding and continuing beyond our reflections, let's now go into a second part. Algo semejante aconteció con los cambios mundiales y nacionales. Since the Mexican Revolution arrived 50 years late in Chiapas, something similar happened with the global and national change. However, there was an important window of opportunity that was the opening of the government to obtain land on national lands or in large farms that could be granted to the landless applicants. This was the determining factor of the period in terms of the interests and the needs of the indigenous people of Chiapas. However, a relationship of asymmetry and inequity in social, economic, political, and religious relations was maintained in Chiapas as the established form. The church, 
took 399 years between the Council of Trent and the Second Vatican Council for the Catholic Church to reunite its leadership, made up of bishops from around the world gathered collegially. The genius of, of Pope John XXIII in convening the Council in 1959 brought about historical changes in the relationships between the Church and the rest of the world, a world by then that had changed a lot and which had emerged in that time. The European or Western world had gone through feudalism, bubonic plague, the beginnings of the capitalist system in the bourgeoisie, and countless conflicts of power over territories and populations. Although the majority of the people lived trapped in ignorance and subhuman poverty, it was the European world that organized an expansion of rampant colonization, especially towards Africa and towards the Americas. For nearly four centuries, the church has had stood aside, and perhaps because of its own lack of awareness, they had been complicit in these acts, with a few exceptions. They had abandoned its mission to be a way for truth, providing ethical guidance for human conduct. It could have an impact on the people, and there was no echo among the colonizing peoples whose identities, goods, and labor were plundered generating enormous wealth and power for the colonizers and for their nations. For many members of the Catholic Church, the Second Vatican Council ushered in an era of hope because it sought the renewal and rediscovery of the Church's mission and of its urgent and necessary task of bringing good news to the people, mainly for marginalized and excluded people, stripped of their dignity as individuals and as peoples. The Second Vatican Council came to challenge the, the church to convert from the encounter with the reality of the poor people, their conditions. It was time to be at the service of building a society with solidarity, justice and fraternity, living in harmony and peace. Selam in Medellin. At the level of the church in Latin America, there was a second general conference of his episcopate called CELAM in Medellin, Colombia in 1968. The bishops acknowledged the terrible backwardness of the church uh, in terms of the situation experienced by the people. They sought to identify a process of transformation towards the values of justice and peace. They declared that the misery that marginalizes large groups is an injustice that cries out to heaven. They acknowledged that families had no access to health or education for their children, that the youth did not find any possibility for higher education, that women were seeking equality in law and fact, and that for peasants, it was necessary and urgent to achieve reforms in agrarian, in agrarian policies. Relating justice to peace, they said that Peace is, above all, the work of justice. Where dignity can be respected, legitimate aspirations can be satisfied and met, and there is access to truth and freedom is guaranteed. The pastoral lines that, established, that were established were to awaken a lively awareness of justice with a dynamic sense of responsibility and solidarity, to defend the rights of the poor and the oppressed, and to denounce the unjust consequences of the excessive inequalities between rich and poor and between the powerful and the weak favoring integration. Therefore, this brings us to make, to make in a second reflection. In this second reflection, we will focus on the church. The Second Vatican Council was the strongest shakeup that the church has had in the last 500 years. It is a direct call to the consciousness of the church to correct and to stop enjoying these material, social and political advantages and privileges. The council was the trigger so that the church could return to its roots of identity, to its mission of love, service, and passionate commitment to the cause of justice and 
to peace building it was and it continues to be a call to live a lifestyle that will be in accordance with the gospels that is to say simplicity and in solidarity seeking harmony and peace in community pope francis the first being himself from latin america has reaffirmed the message of the second vatican council and of the selam in medellin in his recent encyclical called fratelli tutti and he says the signs of the time of the times clearly show that human fraternity and care for creation constitute the only path towards an integral development and peace. Therefore, having analyzed these two dim dimensions, let's move on to Chiapas in itself, to San Cristobal. The Diocese of San Cristobal de las Casas. The Diocese of San Cristobal de las Casas is located in the state of Chiapas. When he was named Bishop, Don Samuel Ruiz Garcia had to face enormous challenges of almost every kind. It is located at the core, at the center and the north of the state. The indigenous languages that are spoken there are Tzetal, Sotzil, Tojolabal, Chol, and Lacandon. The indigenous people live in rural communities, communal lands in the regions of Los Altos de Chiapas, the mountain areas of the north of the state, and in the Lacandona forest. The territory is immense. And in the last 30 years, the road network has grown, mainly connecting the cities and the larger towns. There are still very extensive areas with very few roads. The most important cities within the diocese are San Cristobal de las Casas and Comitán. Uh, cities of smaller size are Ocosingo, Teopisca, Villa Las Rosas, Palenque, Margaritas, Venustiano Carranza, and Trinitaria. The diocese was and continues to be characterized by a situation of poverty, marginalization, and a lot of discrimination, with ancestral and ongoing struggles between the non-indigenous population called Ladinos and the indigenous people. Numerous situations of racial discrimination, exploitation and injustice have described the way that they relate to one another. So the diocese of San Cristobal de las Casas is located in Chiapas. It's the one most to the south. When he was named Bishop, Don Samuel Ruiz Garcia had to face enormous challenges. So he speaks himself here. When I arrived in Chiapas in 1959, we found not just a few marginalized groups, but a significant number of indigenous people in the diocese. Today, they represent a third of the population of Chiapas. The present diocese of San Cristobal de las Casas has 33,000 square kilometers with a million and a half of inhabitants, out of which around 78 or 80 percent are indigenous. Therefore, to find a situation with a majority of indigenous people was a great surprise for me, because before being assigned as Episcopal servant for this diocese, I had encountered very few indigenous peoples previously. Therefore, it was a great surprise and at the same time a great challenge and a great task that we had to face. The first concern was a challenge in terms of integration. I imagined in my first pastoral plan, of course, not consulted with anyone, but just imagined by looking at the reality that we would have to impose teaching Spanish to everyone, because how else would would we be able to evangelize them if there were at least five languages in that territory derived from the ancient Mayan Mayan language? So we had to help poverty disappear or to reduce the impact of poverty. 
on to into ways by collaborating in the improvement of crops so that they would have more income for the indigenous peoples and they would improve their food. So we said we need to teach them the Castilla. We need to put shoes on their feet. We need to help them to eat better. Those were my three pastoral lines. The vicar at the time, being very prudent and patient, let me know that teaching Spanish had already been tried before, but he made me see that the problem was actually much deeper. The geography of the diocese is located in the central and in the northern part of the state of Chiapas. The indigenous languages are Tzetzal, Tzotzil, Tojolabao, Chol, and Lacandon. The indigenous peoples live in rural communities, communal lands in the highlands of Chiapas, the mountainous areas in the north of the state, and in the Lacandon jungle towards the east. The territory is huge, and in the last 30 years, the road network has grown, mainly connecting some of the cities, but there are still large areas with very few roads to communicate. The most important cities within the diocese are San Cristóbal de las Casas and Comitán. Cities of lesser importance and smaller size are Ocosingo, Teopisca, Villa Las Rosas, Palenque, Margaritas, Venustiano Carranza, and Trinitaria. The diocese was and continues to be characterized by a situation of poverty, marginalization, and a lot of racial discrimination, with ongoing ancestral struggles between the non-indigenous population called Ladinos and the indigenous peoples. Many situations of discrimination, exploitation, and injustice continue describing the way in which they relate to one another. New mission in Chiapas. Our arrival uh, to Chiapas was through the Diocese of San Cristobal de las Casas, named after Don Samuel Ruiz Garcia, following Monseñor Bartolomé de las Casas, the defender of the indigenous rights. Don Samuel was named in 1959, he was named Bishop of the Diocese of San Cristóbal de las Casas. He was um, a solid man, a man of solid theological, philosophical, and biblical formation. He spoke Latin, Greek, Aramaic, German, English, Italian, and Later on, he learned Tzetzal and some Tzotzil. At the beginning, his vision and the categories were prior to the Second Vatican Council and corresponded to the previous doctrinal approaches, as he said himself in the video. Don Samuel, astonished by the realities that he saw, asked himself, which is the direction? What and how should we act in the pastoral ministry? The apostolic delegate, who was then a Vatican representative, Monsignor Luigi Raimondi, called Don Samuel and advised him by saying, you need catechists. Look for the Maris brothers and look for the sisters of the Divine Shepherd to be trainers, formators. Following this advice, Don Samuel spoke with the superiors of these congregations, and in December 1961, three young Marists were appointed to create the School of Catechists, which was called the Mission of Guadalupe. The first year had two essential activities for us. The first, was to find the land, we did find it, and to rebuild the mission. So we became bricklayers, uh, carpenters, helpers, until we could actually had, we could actually have the, cath the catechetical center well conditioned with bathrooms, classrooms, dining room, basketball courts, and an inn for visitors. 
the second activity was to start visiting and getting to know the communities of the highlands of Chiapas. The first tour that we made, in it was in the spring of 1962, and it lasted for 10 days. Don Samuel said, brothers, I invite you to accompany me on a 10-day tour of the Tzotzil area. So we went with Father Juan Bermudez, a Chiapa priest who spoke Tzotzil perfectly. At the beginning, we left in a pickup truck for about two hours until the dirt road ended. Then we continued by mule and by horse, and then many other kilometers on foot through the mountains. So we traveled through the towns and the communities of Mitontic, San Ladres, Chenanlio, and finally, we went into the mountain ranges. We crossed the Tzontawits, which is the area that is called the area of 400 hills. That's what it, mean, what it means, Sonza Wheels. The arrival at each place was a party. Rockets would go off. There were harps, guitars, violins, and, and flutes sounding. Smell of incense and the authorities of each place, which were called Principaletic, dressed in their traditional costumes, came up to receive us, to welcome us. During our stay there, we could see the poverty, bare feet, scanty clothes, children's tummies with parasites, isolated villages, no services. We saw several diseases such as diarrhea, um, bronchopulmonary diseases, um, teeth in very bad conditions. In some areas, more than 60% of the adults had or suffered from onchocerciasis, which attacks the eyes, the eyesight, caused by black flies that are usually found when you work in the coffee farms in that area. The communities lacked water and lived in unhealthy sanitary conditions without any medical attention. On the other hand, there, there were no roads, no electricity, very precarious hygiene services, and almost no educational services. On the other hand, we heard very um, high-spirited conversations in Sotzil, but we didn't understand anything. I mean, we understood when there was any indigenous translator close by. All these conditions of shortages did not take away the joy or the generosity of them, since they offered us abundant tortillas, beans, coffee, and sometimes even egg and then chicken broth. To sleep, we began to get used to the fact that the floor with a mat or with some branches would be a pleasant bed. I remember the anecdote that happened to me because I did not know how to ride a horse. When we arrived in Chenalo, they asked us to gallop in in order to be more festive. My horse just kept on running until it reached its paddock. And the people, when they saw me go by, they said, wow, how well this brother rides. I, in fact, did not know how to stop the animal. He threw me over. He threw me over the fence of his paddock. And fortunately, I was not harmed. At night, while sleeping, I saw a tarantula right next to me. But it was not important because I was exhausted and I had blisters on my legs and on my backside. <laughs> Afterwards, other tours followed through Chalchihuatan, Pantelo, Sinacantan, and Chamula in the Tzotzil area. After we visited various towns in Tenejapa, Oxchuk, Cancuc, Huistan, in the Tzeltal region. Later, we entered the municipalities and the regions with many communities of Bachajón, Chilón, Yajalón, Ocosingo, and Altamirano. We visited over 30 communities. Most of them we did on foot. And this is how our first year went by. 
So we ask ourselves, or we make the following reflection up to here, in this beginning, and in our arrival. What did this beginning, this arrival teach us? It made us see and feel with the indigenous people what the condition of being marginalized and forgotten is like. We were able to see, to feel that we arrived where no one visits, where no visitors arrive, where no one hears or listens. And at the same time, we were where there were no alternatives or resource, resources. Death and disease were fatal, and this was part of everyday life. We were also, we became aware of the resilience of these communities in contrast, complete contrast with our almost total vulnerability. We also were able to realize how ignorant we were, how unprepared we were to communicate in their own languages, let alone understand their meanings or their history or their lives. On the other hand, we were absolutely amazed by their affection and their respect for us. They didn't even know us, but their, their, how fine their attention was and their care was. This was exquisite, not by the forms and signs of good manners that we are used to in our cultures, but because they were careful with their words, with their gestures, and they were careful about procuring our, our well-being. They never left us alone but they did give us the space that we needed. We did not know from where or how food was brought to us, how where our sleeping quarters came from, but we did realize that this was, that this stemmed from a shared contribution of the whole community. In order to give testimony for this here, we want to tell you something. This is a song that was from the Lacandona jungle. It speaks of their own condition and it can reflect this condition. We composed this song in 1970, but we want to sing it now because it is related to the life conditions that they had at that time. The words say it's a long walk, it's hard to move forward. A people will be born, a people will be born. Oppressed people, forgotten people, exploited people, wake up, wake up now. Thank you very much. Work. We will continue now. The catechists, the first catechist, and the word of God. On January 6, 1963, the courses for catechists began at the Guadalupe Mission in San Cristobal de las Casas. There was a solemn opening presided by the bishop, Don Samuel Ruiz. And as you can see in this photo, he was blessing the house. These are the dormitory, the rooms for sleeping. The, in their inauguration, apart from Don Samuel, there was also the vicar of the diocese, Monsignor Flor, Monsignor Flores, also Brother Jesus Rodriguez, and also 
several parish priests were present, as well as the first group of catechists elected by their communities. There was dance, there was music. You can see the hats uh, for the dancers that are ready there. There was dance, music, and prayer led by Don Samuel. The catechists were all indigenous adults. Most of them were married. There were also young bachelors among them. The selection of catechists was done, first of all, by talking to the parish priests in the different regions. The parish priests spoke with the communities, and it was the communities themselves that chose their catechists, and they sent them with the mission of preparing to be able to teach the word of God. During their pre preparation, that took about three to four months, the community took care of the needs of the family of the catechists, and they offered them corn, beans, and support for their good care while their family member was away. The catechist received the mandate from the community, and he had the commitment to return back to the community to fulfill his mission. These courses, as Cathy, as Cathy mentioned just now, lasted for about three to four months. And basic elements of the pastoral doctrine were taught and, and also teaching pedagogy. They were, they, they were given classes of literacy, basic writing and numeracy, sports, uh, mainly basketball among, among the young men, and mystic of service and community. They also participated in workshops for different trades, such as baking, carpentry, saddlery, hairdressing, first aid. And there was also a team of welding and a, bla a blacksmith team whose purpose was to make basketball hoops for the communities. The more substantial aspect was the way in which the catechists that were being formed lived this stay together, how they how they experienced it. They collaborated in the tasks with the spirit of great fraternity, and it was a very happy environment where sharing took place, exchange and mutual learning. By the way, a priest came to celebrate mass, and it was sometimes Don Samuel himself who celebrated with the catechists once or twice a week. He usually had breakfast with the catechist and the funniest thing was that without his episcopal robes his episcopal dress he would play basket with basketball with them on the court a very important and useful element was the posada what was called as the posada which was part of the center every day from 20 to 35 visitors arrived there looking for lodging and with the aim of staying there when they had to attend also their chores in the city, their shopping. So the mission became a place where the indigenous people felt very much at home. And many indigenous people became, began to arrive there and they had a, a big array of needs. For example, given the poor health and living conditions, people arrived from communities very ill and the Maris, and they were channeled to the health centers in San Cristobal. There were even some visitors who died there. And what we did is we took their bodies back to the communities in our, in our trucks, in our vehicles, through very little traveled paths. The mission then it was perceived as a place of its own and a point of reference in San Cristobal for many indigenous people. Once from Maxa Tenejapa, a brother arrived. He was wielding a machete. No, sorry, he, he had a machete wound and it took him about a month to heal and to be able to return home. Three months later, he returned to the mission carrying a sack of peanuts and having walked 
about 38 kilometers through the mountains in order to bring this gift. He waved, he handed us the peanuts, and he stayed, he stayed there sitting for three days on the ground, except when we invited him to eat with us. We asked him why he had come back, and he said, you saved my life. I came to be with you and to tell you from my heart and with the peanuts, Hokolawal, thank you. In this way, when the course is finished, each catechist received a recognition and acknowledgement, which they very much appreciated. Upon returning home, we would immediately organize a tour to visit them, to personally see them in their communities. This was an enormous walk. Sometimes it was hundreds of kilometers because of the difficulties of the roads and the intricate mountains, valleys and rivers. This was a major challenge, but it was beautiful. These visits, visiting them, were very valuable. The catechists appreciated it enormously because they saw us arrive and they they introduced us in the community. We get to know the people, we got to know the people and we created bonds of trust and of fraternity. Each course and each visit taught us a lot. And this is why we never repeated the same course in the same way. We always adjusting a adjusted according to the evaluations. We always wanted to improve the teaching and the experience to make it different. A very important trait that we discovered was the people's hearing memory, auditory memory. When there was translation, we started to become aware of the fidelity of this translation and at the same time how appropriate their language was to contextualize and to really interpret what was being said. Another thing that we learned, we, we realized that we didn't know their language, so learning their language became very important. So first we studied Sotsi, which was the language of the ethnic groups that were closest to us and to where we lived. Then we learned Tseltal, which was a language that we really needed to understand each other in a better way. When we learned their language, it was fun that we asked them in Spanish. We asked them questions to the catechist in Spanish and they responded in Tseltal. But the, the difference was that the thought structure was a Mayan Celtal thought structure. And we would repeat, even though at that moment we did not understand. So that's how we were able to acquire gradually some vocabulary. And above all, we were able to understand the linguistic structure. We were able to enter the window of their way of thinking. Between 1963, and 1968, about 600 catechists came through, came, uh, passed through the Guadalupe mission, coming from all over the indigenous area. It is important to mention that there were other formation centers for catechists, each, each one of them coming from different pastoral settings. In the Celtal zone, in the Celtal area of the highlands, uh, it, there was the missionary, the missionaries of Guadalupe, a Mexican congregation that had been working there since the 1950s, along with the sisters, the Mai sisters. The Jesuit fathers in Barchajon and Chilon worked there since the early 60s. The Dominican fathers and the sisters of the presentation worked in Ocosingo and Altamirano also from the beginning of the 60s. La Castalia in the Tojolabal area, it was there since mid 60s. And of course, we also have the sisters of the divine shepherd working or the divine pastor working there since 1963 and the Zoltzil area. 
with the efforts of all of these formation centers and all of the parish priests, the catechistical movement grew. By the end of 2010, there were approximately 10,000 men and women, according to Don Samuel's numbers that incorporated the the incorporating the deacons as part of this progressive development, as well as the principaletic, who were the traditional figures. Realmente, el movimiento catequístico había creado una comunidad de fe muy amplia diversa en lenguas, en territorios, en culturas, unidos... They had created diverse languages. And everything had this sisterhood or brotherhood sense at the service of what they called the Word of God. So let me present two testimonies to you. Ricardo Hernández, who has been living for more than 25 years in Chiapas and supporting the different causes of different cooperatives of men and women in different regions. It is, he knows a lot of La Lacandona forest and the organizations of the societies. So this is what he said. The catechesis taken to these territories during these years with the indigenous population had at least the following three important successes. First, it was understood as a living process in its historical dimension. Two, an awareness of the social actor as a subject for change. And three, community responsibility in the exercise of their rights and construction of future. These are the lessons learned to understand the context that was lived in Chiapas back then. There is another testimony from Miguel Ángel Paz Carrasco. He will explain himself, his connection to Chiapas. Yeah. Miguel Ángel Paz Carrasco. My name is Miguel Ángel Paz Carrasco. I arrived in Chiapas in 1991 and I joined the small team of the Tojo Laval Mission, which has its headquarters in Comitán de Domínguez. Since then, our work has been linked to the work of women and men who were catechists from different Mayan villages in Chiapas and Guatemala, mainly Tojo Laval and Celtal. The work of the catechists is the most profound expression of a new way of being a church, both in Chiapas and in Latin America. It has its roots in the 60s, last century, but it is also the manifestation of the social and cultural vitality of the native peoples. It is in their communitarian being, that is to say, in the capacity to build and to live in the community. I believe it is not only an ecclesiastical or pastoral movement, but it represents a social movement capable of creating changes based on the critical reflection and the practice of transforming the historical conditions of oppression of the indigenous communities, uh, a reflection and a practice that are illuminated by the word of God. I believe that this is one of the keys that explains the theological strength, the strength of this pastoral and ecclesial movement, its ability to acknowledge a living God who speaks in history and who speaks in the struggles to transform reality and to build a life of dignity, justice and happiness for everyone, which is the Lekil Laltik and Lekil Kush Laltik of both Tojo Lavales and Tetzales. And it is a source, a society movement. So they configure new ways of creating a society, of being a society, as of the possibility of living in a community.
Ahora vamos a entrar. So let's move on now to another reflection. We will start with these words by Bishop Don Samuel that show us the progress of his own awareness at the end of his first decade as a shepherd, as a pastor there. We will be able to understand his words as his own experience evolved. So this is after the first decade of being a bishop there. We realized that indigenous catechists who had been trained in Spanish when carrying out their mission among their people and using their own mother tongues were more effective and they could communicate more deeply the core of the gospel message to the communities. Hence, the learning and the knowledge of indigenous languages became a priority. At the same time, many priests, nuns, and even myself began to study those languages ourselves. So this is something that we also took for ourselves, that is to say, for the two of us. We learned that the movement of indigenous catechists was the key. It was the main key to gain trust for a true endogenous Mayan spirituality to flourish, enriching itself from its own identity and its own consciousness. We realized that the roots of the community spirit created new connections between the regions and the languages that fostered a sense of mutual support and mutual unity. The diocese experienced an indigenous leadership that was built from the affirmation of the us, of the we, as a symbol of their belief in the importance of being all together in one heart. So now let's move on to living with the community. We will see an aspect, just one aspect, which will be the affirmed consciousness from the cry for the earth. So there is a, a narration here. It's a true story. It's a very concrete story that we experienced ourselves. It was the evening of an October day in 1964 in San Cristobal de las Casas. On the street, September 16th, number 29, the following scene takes place. There is a white Ladino man who is holding a Tamula Indian by the neck. He subdues him, kneeling before him, and thus, at his feet, he keeps him with his head down, looking at the ground. The young indigenous man receives a torrent of humiliations of physical, verbal, and emotional violence. You brute Indian, you're a donkey. When are you going to learn how to behave? You need to obey me or you'll see, or else you'll see, you bastard. What do you think you are? You want money, you want drinks, you're lazy. And taking a deeper breath, the harasser to continue uh, showing his anger and contempt, he looks up and he realizes that from the second floor of the house across the street, which was the house of the catechists, there was someone looking at him attentively. Faced with this, the man reacts quickly, changes his character completely, and he began, began to caress the chamula with a lot of tenderness and with a merciful gesture and with a pious tone of voice, he says, my sweet daddy, I told you, you have to pray the rosary. And turning to the person who was observing him from the window, he said, brother, I am telling the little Indian here that he must pray the rosary and that he must be good so that God will bless him. <laughs> The person looking at that scene was Javier himself. <laughs> Something quite remarkable indeed. Uh, the Ladino man was an encantador in the farms. His house was the house where 
all the recruited people uh, could stay there. So this story gives us a glimpse of the enslaved lives of indigenous workers who were recruited to work on the coffee farms of Soconusco in Chiapas. For many decades, they have been treated with violence and with deceit, with injustice. Thousands and thousands of indigenous peoples are recruited as temporary workers to harvest coffee. This kind of mistreatment took place because the indigenous lands in the highlands of Chiapas are scarce. They are very steep and they are severely eroded. So each family could have approximately one half to one hectare where they could perhaps harvest between 250 and 400 kilos of corn per year. The alternatives were either to starve to death at home or to go and start working on a temporary work on the farms. It is estimated that approximately 80% of the indigenous men from the highlands of Chiapas migrate for temporary work on the farms. And sometimes they are accompanied by their families as well. This system of the farms consisted of some people in San Cristóbal who were called enganchadores and whose function was to recruit the Indians to take them to the farms. The houses were known to the Indians and they would just go there. They would accumulate, I mean, the workers, the indigenous workers in those places, and they were not allowed to leave so that they would not escape. So forced to stay there with the enganchadores, they had um, drinks, alcoholic beverages of very low quality and high levels of alcohol. So they offered it as an advance to the payment they would receive. So they were made, I mean, they would get them drunk, charging them excessive amounts without clarification. So they were already in debt before they started working. These indigenous people were transported standing up and crammed into trucks for you know, six to eight hours with treatment that was similar to what they would give maybe to their pigs or to their farm animals. The enganchador had almost absolute control of their workers, establishing with them the time and the value of their work with arbitrary and absolutely unequal criteria. For example, they would pay less to the Midontic because they knew less about things. And they paid less to the Chenalo people as well. Or they paid little to the Oxchuk as well because they said that they were more kind of um, tricky or whimsical because they knew a little bit of Spanish and they tried to defend themselves. The living conditions on the farm were inhumane. They worked really hard, they slept in large sheds, they were given very little to it, they didn't have almost access to clean water, and they acquired several gastrointestinal or pulmonary diseases. As we said before, often the um, bites of black fly, flies made them ill with oncos, oncoceriasis, a type of parasitic disease that left them blind after several years because the worm lodges there and destroys the optic nerve. At the end of several months, the workers had little money, they had debts, and they had a lot of diseases or illnesses with which they returned to their lands. They continued living in great poverty and with a very short life expectancy. For us, it was a great pain to know about these situations, these life situations, with almost no possibility of 
undoing or doing away with this system of exploitation. Some indigenous peoples, people knew and were able to take advantage of the opportunity to go and conquer the land of Margaritas areas, creating Nuevo Huistuan, Nuevo San Juan Chamula, Nuevo Jerusalem. In the northern part of the state, there were other indigenous groups that did not have land either, and they lived in the large farms as the acasillados, the ones locked there. They were different from the enganchados because the acasillados were people who lived in the interior of the farms. So they had a small space so that they could live there and they were offered a little part of land, but they were almost slaves. They had the right to work that little plot of land. So that's the only thing they could do to work all day long. And of course, women and children were part of the servants uh, at the head of the hacienda or the farm. And of course, they received no payment whatsoever. Since the 1950s, many indigenous people left the farms to look for another place to live. But it was mainly in the 60s that it became a massive movement with the opening of the government to populate the national line lands. It was uh, during the time that was called the golden decades. And it was mainly towards the areas of Ocosingo and Margaritas and towards the Lacandona jungle, where approximately 60 or 70 villages were created. And at that time, the people conquered the land where, I mean, and they did this with a lot of effort and a lot of struggles. First, some of them went out to try to look for feasible places, that is to say, with water close by. Once a good land had been selected, they prepared to move with the entire community, including women, girls, boys, and the essential objects. Sometimes they would make search trips with everything and with their families. So sometimes it took them months to arrive and to settle down. At the same time, they had to go through an, an enormous agrarian legal ordeal in order to obtain what was called the presidential resolution, that is to say a document that would give them the legal right to own that land in a community way. That is to say, under a system uh, created after the Mexican Revolution, as a result of the revolution, that is called ejidal or ejido, even if it doesn't exist as such nowadays. We accompanied many, many communities in that struggle, and that's what allowed us to experience the feeling of conquering the land side by side. With some communities, we accompanied them to making the layout of the streets, the design of the construction. Some others, we accompanied them throughout the legal process for the agrarian procedures with a lot of traps and robberies and, threat and, and threats. So actually obtaining the documents, the papers, took them several years. The struggle for the land is harsh, but it is very powerful. Those who conquer the land are willing to give their lives to defend it. In a town called Emiliano Zapata, they were making their houses and they needed leaves from a special palm tree for the roofs. So they went to look for it and they arrived at an esplanade in the jungle, in the forest, where they found that palm tree and they were greeted by a man with a machine gun pointing at them and saying get out of here this is private land frightened they returned to their place and chayo who was the community leader told them you can't do that to our people come and let's go all together but without weapons they returned and they went towards the place where the man was. Chayo approached him and said, 
you have two hours to leave and disappear from here forever and without a weapon and turning his back on him calmed and he headed back to his group the rest of the group that is to say the community two hours later a small plane landed in a dirt field and the stranger armed man left never to come back and now it is a moment to pause and do a reflection in relation to this consciousness of the struggle for land. From this, we learned and we experienced that accompanying the lives of the brothers and these communities generates close and loyal bonds, ties. But when one commits to their conquest of the land, that is already another dimension which creates deeper bonds of brotherhood, fraternity, which are for life. We saw and we were able to be witnesses of the importance of conquering the land for the indigenous communities. It is a historical achievement because legally they possess the land and spiritually they are able to transcend. It gives them meaning and value to themselves and finally they are united with the earth with the earth as mother as friend as sister and in union with the animals the water the air and they realize themselves as true mayans by cultivating and living from and with the earth the corn we are and they are aware that those who lived the slavery of being bound and they were able to overcome this condition made a quantum leap from humiliating subjugation to be the forgers and architects of their own freedom and their own dignity so now we want to celebrate this beautiful episode, this odyssey to the capacity of vision, of persistence, and of resilience of a people to fulfill a dream, to live united with the land. The following, the chant that we're going to sing now, this following chant was created in the community of Emiliano Zapata. After they conquered this land, in 1968 in the Lagandona jungle. And these are people who came from Savanilla and Huitipan. Pueblos dejando sus casas, buscando una tierra para vivir. Año del 68, presente lo tengo yo. Formamos colonia aquí en la selva, poniéndole por nombre Emiliano Zapata, poniéndole por nombre Emiliano Zapata. La salida no fue fácil, hubo mucho que aguantar, hambre, sed, dolor, y lluvia, hubo mucho sufrimiento, hubo mucho sufrimiento, construimos un cayuco, una casa para todos, empezamos nuestras milpas, y la tierra producir, y la tierra producir, y la tierra producir, Emiliano Zapata, y señor, 
Todo lo que hemos visto All, everything that we have seen up to now has meaning. It has a certain direction from this energy that has led us here from the civilizing vision of Mesoamerica. And we want to find this meaning, to find this sense through what we call the diamond of consciousness. Throughout our presentations, we want to continue exploring the development of consciousness as the process that is being developed and that seems to be guiding the entire universe towards greater degrees of consciousness, intelligence, and self-reflective life. Consciousness is, in summary, the evolution of the cosmos. Up to now, the human being is the greatest expression of evolution that we know of, because on this planet, humans are the only beings that have self-reflective capacities. We are the only species that understands or knows that we know. The human being is the evolution that has become conscious. It is undoubtedly because his own consciousness and in both individual and collective strives to unite with the universe. And this intention and in this quest we see in the diamond, a symbolic reference that speaks of the linking of uh, the whole in unity. In order to continue with this idea of the diamond as something that allows us to enter consciousness, what is a diamond? diamond is a mineral of pure carbon. It origin, its origin is extreme heat and pressure. It crystallizes in a cubic fractal system. It is a material of maximum hardness and also durability. It has, it is very, very bright and luminous and it is achieved through good carving, and it has multiple facets with a high index of refraction and expansion of light. In this way, it gives us ideas about what our consciousness is, what it is made of, and how we can observe it. Through the sessions that we have held until now, we see in the diamond's facets a cosmic connection. Hunabku, the origin of everything, the beginning and the origin of movement and measurement. The Tzolkin, as a guide to the journey of the meaning of life. The Chulel as unity, as spirit, and as consciousness. The Popol as the book of the community. The structure of Mayan languages that unite the I with the we. The totality, heart of the sky, heart of the earth. The demand for a civilizational reorientation in the face of the dominant system. Lifestyle grounded in simplicity, harmony, and community, forging freedom and dignity with autonomy and community, bonds of unity, community, earth, land, and spirit. And we have just gone over many of the dimensions that we saw in previous sessions. And our other consciousness today has affirmed the 
call or the cry for land. And we finish with a motto for all of these sessions that we have had until now, which is Unash Kotantik Ayotik. In a single heart, we are we are and we stand for common good this talks about our experience and it will continue to be the largest desire the largest wish of communities unash means only one single kotantik means our heart and ayotik is we are for common good so it means in a single heart we are we stand for common good thank you very much Thank you.